teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, friend, who said me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take care of me. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, What should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool. This very night, your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is for those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. And this is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. In Massachusetts, I grew up in a small town, East Long Meadow. We didn't have a high school, so they would bus us into Springfield, where all the high schools were. And back in those days, the high schools were dedicated very much to a specific <coughs> learning track. Uh, there was the vocational high school, a high school where you could learn trades, commerce high school, which we went to for business, technical high school, which was one among the sciences, classical high school, which I went to emphasize languages, humanities, arts, and music. And the high school itself was built before the turn of the 20th century, but it was a classic. And all the classrooms around this square, in the middle of the square, was the auditorium. And it was three stories high, and each story had like a um, hallways that were built around the auditorium so that you could look down. When you're on the third floor, you look down at this beautiful auditorium with a beautiful Steinway Grand Piano. And every day after lunch, this one person would eat quickly and he'd go into the auditorium to play the piano. And he did this for his pleasure, but also to see who he could gather around that. And every once in a while, you would see uh, two or three adoring girls kind of leaning on the piano. <laughs> and, you know, I remember walking by, and after he had finished playing some piece by, I believe, Franz Liszt, one girl said, that was beautiful. And he looked up into the sky and he said, yes, it was, wasn't it? <laughs> he came from a wealthy family. They lived in a mansion house on top of Long Hill Street along with other mansions. And he was the third generation who lived in that house along with his parents and his grandparents still lived there too. He is possibly one of those third generation type of people who has nothing to worry about because he comes from a lineage, lineage of people who made a lot of money investing in a new type of product. He never really wanted to talk about it, you see, because most of his neighbors on Long Hill Street were in banking or finance or insurance, and what he didn't want us to know is that his family made a mint in producing absorbing junior. <laughs> So all his wealth was predicated on you having Natalie's foot. <laughs> but being the haughty person that he was, he just kind of was one of these third generation people who didn't want to admit where all this money came from, so he wouldn't talk about it. He simply was one of these people who, you know when, you, when you're talking to him, you can tell he's not listening. It's kind of like he's looking to the side of your face. I don't know what ever happened to him, but it was one of those type of people who, who simply, quote, had it good, voted best dressed uh, in the yearbook, and after I graduated, never heard from them again, but I thought about them very much so in reading this morning's gospel. Because what we have here is that tangential quality of what it is to have in this rich person, what it means to get really, really wealthy stuff. It's no secret that Jesus talks about money an awful lot and what it does to people. And this, of course, is one of those classic stories. First of all, 
you've got a brother who comes and says, tell him to divide my family inheritance with me. And that kind of demand says that his kind of attitude is visible in the way he says it, and perhaps in the way also that Jesus hears it. And Jesus is real quick and says, I'm not your arbitrator. I'm not going to get involved in this. I have the feeling I know why you're here and what your demands are and what your heart really is all about. And so he goes on to tell them this story of this person. It's a rich guy. He's already got a lot of money, right? He's into gardening. Fields, crops, and all of that kind of stuff, and it's a bumper year. Couldn't be better. And it's so much so that he looks at everything that he owns, and there's no place to store this. Now, he has an option at that point because his barns are already full. He can't put any more in. But he says to himself, ah, tear everything down, build it all over again, build it bigger and better. Take everything that I've got, and I will have it made. Yes, sir. And the story is such an interesting one because look at how he speaks. He's talking. We have a soliloquy going on here, right? I will pull down my barns, a little larger at the time. And then all of a sudden, he's talking to himself within himself. Notice that? And I will say to my soul, oh, he's got a conversation going on between him and his soul. This is really good. Relax, be merry, dream. Laid up for many years. The ultimate narcissist, you say, the ultimate egotist, you say, and you're probably right. And the story has a very, very good, comprehensive idea going on behind it because, notice, he never goes outside of himself. It never occurs to him that there's anyone else in his family, perhaps, that he has any friends. What he stores up is specifically for himself and himself only. And this probably is the most devastating thing that could possibly happen when wealth happens, where suddenly it's not shared. And if there's anything to be shared about the gospel, it is always this whole idea that Jesus pulls us into community. He pulls us into relationships with each other. And without that, nothing happens. And there's no wonder in that show that I was talking about earlier that this one man said, I'm not sure if I want to have Jesus. Because everything that I've heard about and read about in the Gospels, he is a confrontationalist. And I might have to see myself over what I really am all about. Do I find myself in this story? Do I find myself in the story of the Good Samaritan? Do I find myself in the story of the prodigal son? I'm not sure if I can face that type of reality. St. Augustine, the fourth century theologian, said it good. He said, God gives us people to love and things to use. And the greatest tragedy in life is when that's all flipped over and all of a sudden we use people and love things. And it happens so easily because greed is such a natural factor. The avarice of, I've got to have more. If you don't believe this, as is often said, and I've said it before, take time this week and look at every advertisement you've ever seen on television. They will first produce for you a need that you didn't know you had. And then they will prescribe a remedy to that. And it will be usually something that you can buy. Have you ever heard, I, I, I'm feeling so alone today. Oh, you should treat yourself at Denny's Grand Slam breakfast. And so you go and you eat alone. Something doesn't make sense. There's a radicality of all this, what Jesus says, and pulls us into something radically different than what we want to do. Augustine is right. Be careful, lest you wind up loving things. Be careful, lest you wind up using people. And it's so easy to make that transition. This man is doing it. All he can see is it's been a bumpy year. And he may even say that God is blessing me. That probably is the most incongruous thing that would ever happen to him. Because now he is like, you might say, the black hole, you see, where everything is sucked right into him. There is no talk about anybody else. Now, lest we be careful, there's an awful lot of guilt that can go on in Christianity that makes us, especially here, who are probably
probably living in the, one of the richest companies in the uh, countries in the world, and also probably not living what I would call in poverty. I don't live in poverty. I don't think any of you do either. And before we get this idea that what we have is a guilt complex going on here, it is not so much what you have, it is what you're going to do with it, how you treat it, how it expresses how you treat other people. The concept, the idea that the more I have, the less other people will have. So therefore, I am better. Or better still, the concept of the great Protestant ethic, work ethic, that the more you have, the more God seems to be blessing you. And this whole text this morning shatters that whole idea. It can't hold on to this one. No siree. God isn't about to let you either. It's catch 22. So, as I walked into the topics this morning, and Marty's going to talk to us in a moment, the little thermometer on our collection of money for our September project of uh, End Hunger Now is going beautifully. And it is the measure of a community or a congregation that says, it isn't, you see, how much money I have. Perhaps it is how I use it. And over again, our community, like so many other Christian communities, is called and say to ourselves, take a look at the text. And be careful that you don't reverse the procedure. Not meant to love money, but meant to love people. We're not meant to use people, we're meant to use things. And money is just one of those things. So I think, you know, throughout the summer and as we move to vacation, get into September, and kind of come back into all of the things that we do here at St. Luke, it's that measure of time that we say to ourselves, maybe if I were on an island alone with Jesus, that I might not want to hear what he has to say. But maybe where the reality is, it's maybe what I need to hear said to me. And that, of course, is, is the measure of our own humanity. And what we say when we say it's God's work in our hands. That's the whole measure of how we respond to these type of things, what we want to say to each other. How we want to treat each other, not just within this church, Easiest place in the world to be nice to each other is a church, yes sir. Isn't it? It's when you walk out the door and you've made up with those people who aren't really kind of like you. As a matter of fact, you really probably could give them some very important advice. If only they would listen to you. And once you give that to advice, that is their opportunity to give you advice of what you should do. Be careful. Hmm, so let's take a look at the text again. The land of a rich man produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, not to his wife, not to his children, not to his friends, he thought to himself, what should I do, for I have no place to store my crops? And then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns, and I'll big, build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, as if I talk to your soul, Soul, you have good ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool. This very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? And you heard all about that in the first reading, didn't you? Out of Ecclesiastes. This man who's kind of at the end of his life, he sees what has accumulated. And all of a sudden, he realizes that once he's gone, everybody's going to be there like poachers, picking over the remains, and they'll get everything that he worked for. And who knows what they may do with it? That's the galling of David, isn't it? And if you are like Leslie and I, and you have had parents who passed away, and you have to go through their house and clean it out, and you say to yourself, why did they keep this? Why did they keep that? Why was it important? Well, some things are important. Pictures, remembrances, etc., and so on. But that's even the lowest level. Upon all of that, we begin to think of ourselves. What have we accumulated? And why did we accumulate it? What is dear and what is precious? And if it is pictures of people you love, then maybe you've got it right. He did give us people to love and things to use. And if there are things that you must get rid of in your parents' house and you have to do that type of work, then they are only things. We ought not to make anything but what they are for those things. Oh, it's a difficult 
thing getting old, they say, and I'm beginning to feel lonely, Siri, and I look at old my attic and I say, how can I leave this pile of junk to my kids? How dare I? And they'll look at it and say, why on earth did they keep this stuff? Why did they do this to us? And suddenly all the stuff that we thought was important, they call a company that will do the work for you. And they're pawing through all that stuff that you thought was so precious and saying, throw it out, get rid of it, get to read. It's stuff that you don't want to really think about, but it's a reality. Except it's always somebody else's reality, and we don't think that's going to be part of our own life. But in this text, it says right down at the bottom, God says, you fool, it's all over. Not next week, not next week, tonight, before you even tear the bar down. Man proposes and God disposes. You know that old saying, don't you? So, what do you want to do with all your junk? We've moved, I don't know how many times, nine times since we've been married. And every time we moved, at least the last three times, we said, we're getting rid of stuff. Yes, we are. And we did. When we went off to seminary out of a seven-room house in a four-room apartment, we had so much junk to get rid of, I called a man and asked him to come at night so no one would see how much junk we were getting rid of. <laughs> I was embarrassed. And so then we moved from one house to another, all through ministry, and now we come down to Richmond, swearing once again. And guess what? The attic is full of it. It's all over us again. Why? Because I don't want to take the time to go through all of that stuff. Ah, I'll have my kids doing this. And as they fall through all of that stuff, they'll say, what on earth are these things that were so important? It gives us a lot to think about this text this morning. We don't have farms to tear, tear down, I'm sure. I'm sure that even if the stuff that you accumulate can't even equal what was being said in the text this morning. But it calls us to really think and think hard. Where am I? Where am I going? What gives me a reason to take up time and space on earth? It won't be what I do. It won't be what I've accumulated. Because in the final run, when we have been called for that moment in time, there's only one thing. Did you love people and use things? You're still here this morning, aren't you?